So we'll start with limits. Obviously, continuity requires limits. So if you don't have limits, you can't talk about continuity. So we'll start out with lim x approaches a f of x equals l. Now the type of functions we are using, this function has n dimension inputs and one dimension output. So what type of a thing is L? L is a scalar. L is a scalar or a real number. So L is a number. What type of thing is X and also A? They're numbers. They're, no, they're going to be n-dimensional vectors or points, however you want to think about them. So back when we looked at vector valued functions, the input was a number, the output's a vector. Here it's the inverse, the input is a vector, the output is a number. So let's go ahead, this is exactly how the notation looks, but now we're going to be a little more careful about what x is. So x is a n-dimensional point. Now if the dimension's higher than three, you can't just write x, y, z, whatever comes after z, because nothing really does. So we'll go and write it with x1, x2, et cetera, to xn. So those are the n-dimensional inputs right there. In three dimensions and two dimensions, you'll see it as xy or xyz. So let's write down the definition of the limit. This is called the epsilon delta definition of the limit. So we start out with any positive epsilon, any epsilon greater than zero. There exists a delta greater than zero such that x minus a less than delta implies f of x minus l less than epsilon. So that's the definition. <clears throat> this uh, double arrow that I just wrote down, if you forgot about that, I'll just write what that means. A double arrow B means if A, then B. So that's all the double arrow means. It's an if-then statement. So if A is true, then B has to be true. So that was just notation for logic right there. So it says if x minus a is less than delta, then f of x minus l is less than epsilon. All right, so let's think about what we're actually looking at here. Let's take the numerical part first. f of x minus l. f of x is a number, l is a number, so we're taking absolute value of numbers. So it underlines regular. That's just, just like it is in normal uh, calculus one definition. These are numbers, and so we're using absolute value. Now we're going to look at x minus a. So if you take two n-dimensional points and subtract them, what do you get? Vector. You get a vector. And what do the vertical bars mean around a vector? Magnitude. So we're looking at magnitude of a vector right here. Magnitude of an n-dimensional vector. I can draw a picture of that pretty easily. Here is the point x. Oh, that's the point a, not the point x. a is the thing not moving, so a is the value we're getting close to. And how close? The answer is delta close. So I'm going to draw around a, a neighborhood the radius is going to be delta, and so x has to live inside this uh, disk. So what we're looking at is a disk of radius delta. So a is at the center, and then x can be anything inside the disk. And what we do in the limit is we look at what happens when delta gets smaller and smaller. This disk contracts and gets close to a. 
what does that mean about the output? I don't really want to call it the y value, but the output of the function. Is that getting close to the number L? So good news is the definition doesn't need to be rewritten whatsoever. It's the exact same definition. We're just dealing with a magnitude of a vector instead of difference of numbers and absolute value. The good news is when you eventually go n-dimensional inputs and m-dimensional outputs, your definition stays exactly the same. It's just both of those are vectors. Different dimensions, but they're both going to be disks around different points or vectors, however you want to think about it. <clears throat> if you happen to be in one dimension, I will draw the picture for one dimension. Here's A, and our neighborhood, we use a delta neighborhood, so you can go delta either direction, and your x has to come from either over there or over there. It has to be close to A within delta of A. So that's what the disk looks like in R1. And when we went ahead and looked at actual limits of real functions, we had A. Now, I don't necessarily want to write F of A here because there could be a hole in the graph, but that would be L. And we would need to be close to A right here. And then we basically went up and looked at how close to L did we need to be, and then took the minimum of those right there. So that's how we did the definition of a limit back in the day. I'll use green for these, that'll make it look a little more clear. So we would basically go and take the shortest distance away from L. That was our uh, neighborhood there. <clears throat> so drawing a picture is less useful now because there's n dimensions and one dimension. So I can't just draw a nice picture for you anymore. Uh, there is one way you can kind of cheat and do this. All you do is say this is Rn, drawn as a line. You can kind of visualize it if it's a plane, sort of, but where you're kind of seeing a sideways view of a plane, but then you're missing a lot. So you can kind of say this is Rn, and that's R, the output. All right, so let's go ahead and write down some, well, let's write down first how do we show a limit exists, and then we will go ahead and write some rules, and then compute some limits. So to show that lim x approaches a f of x equals l, what we have to do is take any positive epsilon We have to show there exists a delta greater than zero with the right properties. So we actually begin with f of x minus l. You begin here. You do algebra, usually, and you get down to, hopefully, x minus a less than something. And this something is equal to delta. So that's how we prove limits way back in the day. You start with your epsilon, how far are you away from the limit value? And then you work backwards to show there has to be some delta that leads to this property. So we'll look at some limit rules. What is a limit of a constant? Constant, so that one's easy. So we're taking x and a to be in our n. A 
L, and M are going to be real numbers here. So our inputs, A and X, are going to be n-dimensional points. And I'm going to use the letters L and M and C for numbers. So there's our constant limit. Next limit, C times F of X. What can I do with a constant times a function when I'm finding the limit? So I can bring the constant outside. It's also true with derivatives, but specifically limits, you could bring constants through. You can't bring anything through if you want, but if it doesn't change with x, you can bring it outside. So any constants you could bring through. If, if you knew what that limit is, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so next we have the sum rule. So we have a limit of f plus g. This will be the limit of f of x plus lim g of x. So the first rule is constant multiple. And the second rule was the sum rule. First rule is just constant rule. I'm going to use the word laws instead of rules because I'm about to do the product law, which is definitely not the same as a product rule with derivatives. So if you have the limit of a product, it is the product of the limits. All right, all these are only true when the limit actually exists, especially the product rule. So these two must exist. We have a quotient rule, or I should say quotient law, not the quotient rule. Then we have, we'll have the power law as well. Now on this quotient right here, you have to make sure that denominator better not be zero. Now if your denominator is zero, if your numerator is also zero, then you can use L'Hopital's rule. And the last rule we have is power law. Now, as long as your power is constant, you can write this as limit of f, whole thing raised to the c power. So I'm going to write something out of order that sort of fits in here notationally, but requires a property I have not described yet. What property of the function f do I need for this last equality to be true? Constant. Not constant, although it does start with the c. If I know my function is continuous, that's when you can pass the limit inside your function. So when f is continuous, 
at x equals a. You can push your limit through your function. Now, I haven't described continuity yet, which is why I said it probably doesn't belong directly here, but we'll describe continuity soon. Continuity basically means your limit value is equal to your value when you plug that in. That's basically what continuity means. So let's do some examples. So this first limit will have xy approaching negative 3, 4. And our function will be x squared plus y squared. These example problems are intentionally super easy. So these limits should be pretty, especially this first one, very easy to compute. All right, so go ahead and find this limit right here. The first rule you can use is the power rule, so you can push the limit through the square root. Then you can use the sum rule and the other two power rules. You can also just apply it all at one time. So this first limit, we get 5. at the end of the limit. Can you use a smaller font or a bigger limit? You can write the word limit bigger and use a smaller font, but unfortunately it just, I don't know, it's just there's not a short way. I guess you could write your points vertically. If you really want, you can write it like that. If that works better for you, it's fine with me. We normally write things horizontally unless you take linear algebra, then you end up writing everything vertically pretty much. So it doesn't matter how you write. Vertically, you do save commas. So I should have brought that point up earlier. You do save commas when you write vertically. All right, what's the problem with this limit? So if you plug it in, you're divided by zero. But we do have zero over zero. We have a slight problem, though. If we try L'Hopital's rule, what derivative do I take? Oh, an x derivative, a y derivative, both, neither. All right, so we got a slight problem. <clears throat> what we're going to do instead, let's think about what it means to approach 0, 0. So I'm just going to draw r2. Here is 0, 0 at the origin. So let's think about approaching the origin. How many ways can I approach the origin? Lots of ways. We can all think of ways. So let's think of some different ways. I'll use a different color. The regular two ways to approach might be like that along the x-axis. So let's think about what these look like. If I approach on the positive x-axis, what will the points look like? What will be the y-coordinate of all these points? Zero. Zero. And the x-coordinate, I can just write x. Uh, maybe I'll go crazy and write t right here. So what I'm doing is I'm parameterizing a path that leads to the origin. I'm going to parameterize a bunch of different paths. So the two arrows I drew can both use this t0, and this will be alpha 1 of t. 
So this is my first path I'm creating right here to get to the origin. Now I'll switch to blue, and I want you to write down alpha 2 of t, a function that leads to the origin along this path. It should be pretty obvious what alpha 2 is. So what function is alpha 2? 0 t. All right, let's get a third path going. So I could approach in this kind of diagonal way. And we'll call this alpha 3 of t. What is this third path? Assuming that I'm approaching in a 45 degree angle. T, t. So they're both the same coordinate. Every path I wrote so far is linear. Each one approaches in a straight line. <clears throat> Let's make one path that is not a straight line. The easiest one I could think of is a parabola. So I'm just going to do the standard y equals x squared happy parabola right here, just to keep it easy. So I'm going to draw the parabola on both sides here, going towards the origin. And we'll call this alpha 4. What functions of t would I use for alpha 4? So would it be t squared t or t t squared? So I think we all can see the equation would be y equals x squared. So if I knew x, y is that squared. So if x is t, y is t squared. So when in doubt, write the rectangular equation. And then if you can have it solve for y or solve for x, turn your rectangular equation into a parametric equation. So any questions on turning that y equals x squared into that path right there? Now let's think about what we're doing with the limit here. We're supposed to be talking about if we get close to the origin, if no matter which way I'm approaching the origin, if I'm getting closer to it, I should, my output should be close to the L value, the limit value. So it should be independent of which alpha I choose here. So all of these choices of alpha should lead to the same limit. If I find two different paths that give me two different limit values, that means just like before where we had two one-sided limits, if they didn't agree, our limit doesn't exist. The problem is we don't have a two-sided limit, we have an infinite-sided limit. Not four-sided limit, but you could approach any of the paths and there's an infinite number of paths I didn't draw up here. I just drew some easy paths that I could create in a couple seconds. So you could have some weird spiral path going into the origin. You could have a cubic path. You could have a square root path. There's lots of different paths you can choose. So let's take these paths. I'll just do alpha 1. And I'm going to plug in alpha 1 into our limit. All right, so what's going to change, and I'll just use the uh, green marker here. Plug in alpha 1 into the limit. All right, so in alpha 1, we have x equal t, y equal 0. So that's what alpha 1 does. x is t, y is 0. That's all you need to know. So we have lim, I'll write in white, I'll write the original limit, and then right below it, I'll write the new limit. So x, y, that is t comma 0 approaches 0, 0. 
And I have x is t, so I have t squared minus x is t, y is 0, divided by square root t minus square root, oh, nope, x is t, y is 0. OK. <clears throat> so any questions on the substitution? It's, there's really nothing special going on with substitution. It's super straightforward. I'm taking out x, taking out y, putting in their t versions. So algebraically, this is going to the zeros. We don't need those. So I just have t squared over square root t. That's t to the 3 halves power. So I got t squared on top, t to the half power on the bottom, subtract the powers of t to the 3 halves. You can rewrite your limit. I'm going to highlight the part that doesn't matter. Hey, look, zero is approaching zero. Yeah, OK. But the important part is t is approaching zero in this one. So you could be a little lazy and just write t approaches zero. If you want to be fully correct, you should really copy down the, the points approach, the t comma zero approaches zero, zero. But zero is already zero. All right, so what is this limit here? Oh, I think we actually have a slight problem. So this is square root t cubed is another way to write t to the 3 halves. If t is positive, I agree that this is 0. What's the problem with t being negative? What would we? It would be imaginary until you hit zero. I'm going to write zero with a question mark, so I don't want to get too far into the uh, complex analysis. So let's just say probably zero. Let's pick some more paths and approach zero. All right, let's ignore the, let's see. Let's ignore the other, the blue path, and do alpha 3 and alpha 4 right now. So approach on those two. I have a feeling alpha 2 is going to be too similar to what we just computed. So compute uh, the alpha 3 path and the alpha 4 path. And then see if you get 0 or something different. And what you're doing is really similar. You're just subbing out x and y for the different t functions. So I just wrote up the substitutions you make for those.
So I got undefined on my TT path and zero on my TT squared path. So any questions on getting those? Oh, oh, so that should have been squared. Mm -hmm. So that would give me t squared 1 minus t. So that's t to the 3 halves. OK. All right, <clears throat> so here's some, so good news is if you get any path with a different value, you can say your limit doesn't exist. So I got undefined, well, or undefined. If any of them are undefined, your limit also doesn't exist. So if any two paths give different limits, of different limit values or undefined, then the limit doesn't exist. And we'll use DNE for does not exist for the limit. All right, so we found two different paths that gave us uh, two different values. So it's much easier to show a limit does not exist. To show a limit exists is actually quite tricky. Unless you have an easy, nice, continuous function where you can just plug in the values. All right, so if I write, if I want to write this uh, formally, what we just did so to show lim x approaches a f of x not l. So create two paths alpha one, alpha two. And then you're going to look at the limit of f of alpha 1 of t as t approaches, I'm just going to write this as t naught. And then limit f of alpha 2 of t as t approaches t naught. And this assumes that the two paths that these two paths, alpha 1 approaches A as T approaches T naught. I made some easy paths, so my T naught happened to be 0. I recommend you try to make your paths work out so that T approaches 0 is the value that your paths approach A. And then alpha 2 needs to approach A also as T approaches T naught. So this is to show that the limit is not L. To show limit is L is quite tricky. So conversely, finding two paths giving the same limit does not mean the all paths give the same limit.
So I want you to show this limit does not exist. So start to finish. Oh, I still be showing this to next class. All right, so on this problem, you're going to pick two different alphas that lead to two different limit values. You can also, if you find an alpha, uh, an alpha path that is undefined, you can stop right there. So if you find one path that leads to no limit, you can actually stop right on one path. So sometimes you get lucky and find an undefined, a path that leads to undefined limit. Just looking at this problem, what path do you think would be, lead to an undefined limit? X is zero, Y is zero. Just make X zero. So all we're gonna do is approach on the, is that X axis or Y axis? You actually want to approach on the y-axis, forcing your x-coordinate to be 0. So you'll have undefined the entire time. So this one will actually be really easy to show. It does not exist.